in the current moment uh, of international tension, uh, of rising tension between uh, China and America in particular, I mean, I think it's, uh, it's easy to think of previous moments in history in which there was mounting tension that led ultimately to disaster. And one thinks of the 1930s. We're coming out of a period of financial crisis, of prolonged economic and social disorder, and there is mounting tension at the same time. I think the, my reassuring sense um, is that we're not in a 1930s moment. At one point in the book, I say that if you'd written a 10-year history of 1929, you would have been in 1939. We're not, we're not in that space. The big difference is that the 30s was overshadowed by World War I. And we really do mercifully live as a generation or as generations in a period no longer overshadowed by total war. There are some societies in which war is much more present than it is in the West. Both China and Russia have much stronger memories of World War II than we do. But nevertheless, these are not societies which have actually been traumatized by conflict. And it takes the combination, I think, of total war and economic and social crisis and political crisis to really add up to the kind of situation we had in the 1930s where millions of people could be mobilized for extraordinarily radical politics with an epic sense of what it was that had, was at stake and what it was that needed to be achieved for better or worse. And this may also contribute, of course, to the lack of energy in our politics, the lack of energy in our democracy. But for better, in that sense, we are not in that moment uh, of massive uh, polarization and, and radical mobilization. It's difficult to imagine Europeans or Americans rallying for a confrontation with China. Uh, that isn't, seems to me, the kind of world that we're in. Uh, there is the problem uh, of, of tensions in East Asia. There are very real diplomatic issues around North Korea, around Taiwan that could escalate. And on the Chinese side, there is a live politics of mass mobilization around nationalism but uh, it doesn't seem to me to be an imminent threat in the West. The, the economic crisis that began in 2008 and then extended out into the Eurozone crisis after 2010 and extended in Europe all the way down really to 2014 as a real recession, um, begs comparison with other moments uh, in economic history. Um, but it's also rather distinctive. Uh, it has in common with those earlier moments that it produces sharp inequality. It produces a huge division between the worlds of people whose lives continue on almost as normal as the majority of people's lives did continue on, both now and in the Great Depression, say, of the 1930s. And a minority of people, sometimes a large minority of people, depending on where you are, which region of Spain you're in, which region of Europe you're in, who suffer immediate, acute and dramatic disruption to their lives. And of course, those differences last and they endure, because if you suffer that kind of blow to your biography, it's not something that you can easily make up. And that damage lasts on uh, in European society, as it did in the 1930s. It took generations for Europe and the United States to overcome the trauma of the 1930s. I think the big difference between the two moments, certainly when we view the crisis of 2008 from a global perspective, rather than focusing on the hot spots in Europe, is that we never did descend into the depths of the Great Depression. In Greece, one would have to say they experienced something like the 1930s, and there are parts of Spain which did too. But if you compare the experience of the world economy after 1929 with that of the world economy after 2008, in the first 12 months, the crises look very similar. They're running together. The fall in trade and industrial production um, is the same uh, uh, in the Great Depression as it is um, after 2008. But the difference from 2009 onwards is that everywhere outside Europe, a recovery set in that really uh, brought the American economy, if not back to where it should have been after if we had extended the trends of 2008 onwards, then at least back to something close to full employment. And this, I think, really sharpens the question uh, about the experience of Europe, and particularly countries like Spain, Greece, Italy, Ireland, Portugal, in this crisis, which is that their experience bordered on that of the 1930s. Indeed, in the case of Greece, it's much worse than Greece's experience in the 1930s. And one has to ask why. And the problem is, the problem for the political class of Europe is that the arrow of responsibility points squarely at Brussels, at Frankfurt, at Berlin, at the command centers of the Eurozone, where the things that could have been done to alleviate this crisis were not done. 
How does one digest politically the kind of experience that young people in Spain uh, have suffered over the last 10 years with youth unemployment rates of 50% or even higher in Greece? When you explain this to Americans, they don't understand how this could be the case. Spain is an economic and political entity the size of Texas. If Texas had experienced 50% youth unemployment, American polit politics would be an uproar. It would be a crisis of national proportions. And yet somehow this was buried inside the Eurozone and buried inside the EU. So I think that's one of the really telling differences is that we know in this crisis what was necessary to fix the problem. We've got instances of how it was fixed in other economies and other societies no further away than the United States. It's clear what policy tools were necessary to deal with this. And those policies were not taken. Those steps were not taken. And that is an acute challenge to the leadership of the European political class in its current form. No one should be surprised uh, if they diagnose a crisis of European democracy at this moment. How long can one go on denying that a political system has to deliver outputs. It has to deliver the future prospects of a reasonable life to a vast majority of the population, and especially its younger generations. And if it doesn't do that, it will suffer a catastrophic loss of legitimacy. And that's precisely what has indeed ensued in Europe, precisely as a result of the fact that this crisis was governed. This crisis was steered in large parts of the rest of the world and indeed in some parts of Europe. And other parts were left basically in a, a state which uh, undermines, is bound uh, in the long run to undermine the legitimacy of existing institutions. So that, I think, is really the kind of historic difference, precisely the fact that we understand how to deal with this crisis and that it wasn't done. Uh, and that is a really, I think, a, a heavy question that it's difficult to escape the, the long run implications of.